The second speaker is Oscar Weser. That Hello. Talk about uh, Hello. Uh, J, uh, the, uh, the optimal J value for someone. So, hello, <clears throat> my name is Oscar Wieser and I'm in the subgroup of Giovanni uh, in the Lavi group at the MPI for solid state research in Stuttgart. And in my abstract, I kind of promised also stochastic Google gas CF, as Giovanni said, it's not completely finished. We did the nitrogen dimer, but no serious calculations yet. And so I will just concentrate on the spin purification while I first on the panel. No, I think the wire first or the penalty approach. So you all know the CI problem and we want to do, as you can see on the CI problem to achieve very large active spaces. And we want to do this in a spin pure way. And we are lazy and we don't want to rewrite all the other codes and theory that is there. So it should be somehow compatible with stochastic gas, because we do transpolate and so on. And if you want to do spin pure calculations, you can either do spin adaptation or spin purification. Spin adaptation would be a basis of spin eigenfunctions, for example, via Google. Uh, then you have no spin contamination by contraction trivially. You might specify the wave function, uh, but you also have disadvantages like complicated evaluation of matrix elements. And if you go to spin purification, you stay in the basis of later determinants which is conceptually necessary if you want to have anisotropic Hamiltonians and you have simple and fast calculation of matrix elements. And there is just more rich theory in general and implementations that work in a slightly determinant basis. And just to mention it, last workshop, I talked about stochastic PCHP gas CF in a slightly determinant basis. This is just working out of the box really. And um, so just to, Kind of repeat what uh, just Giovanni just said. Uh, if you have a ground state method in state determined basis and you're starting with a starting with, with a given spin projection, you will converge to the lowest energy solution that has a larger or equal S value in the absolute value. So that means if you have ferromagnetic order, any starting guess you will choose will converge to the high spin ground state. If you have anti ferromagnetic order, you can directly target specific uh, spin pure states with your spin projection. And then the simple approach is to then just uh, use this um, perturbed Hamiltonian with a spin operator. And that's nothing new, but what is new that it, it works extremely well with SAQMC. And uh, we also improve on the literature because we show that there is a plateau of optimal J values also in terms of performance, because it does not only matter that you get anti ferromagnetic or that the J choice actually affects the performance of your convergence. So I will talk about the choice of optimal J, recap FJQMC working equations, and then talk about uh, some applications in detail. So FJQMC is based on the imaginary time propagation where we start from a starting guess. Usually it's just one determinant, and um, we can assume that we expand our starting guess into eigenstates of our Hamiltonian. And if you see this and you just make the tau larger, you will like intuitively see that you project out all the high energy eigenstates. So if you then let go, tau go to infinity and do some renormalization on the way, then you will just converge to the ground state. And so far, there is nothing stochastic here that can be done from deterministically. And sorry, uh, sorry, if you look at this and look at the J choice we saw before, you would just say larger J pushes up the high spin states even further. And then one point, the equation 1.2 will just converge faster. So there you would say high J is just good. The truth is a bit more complicated because we don't use the full exponential operator, but we tailor linearize it and then use this projector. And also this is still fully deterministic. And as you can see, it's basically just the power method using that projector only done stochastically. So, and in the following discussions, I will still assume that we do a fully deterministic propagation with that operator. And so I will also assume that we have time steps set like this, which just, um, creates the fastest uh, convergence. And I just want to mention that the delta tau in stochastic uh, Monte Carlo method is then usually smaller. Okay, 
So we have this power method and uh, we can now calculate the eigenvalues of our projector. If we look at the lambda one eigenvalue corresponding to the energy ground state, we have an eigenvalue of one and the highest energy state will have an eigenvalue of zero and all the ones in between are between one and zero. So if you repeatedly apply it, you will just remain with the ground state. And now if you go back to linear algebra textbook for the speed of convergence of the power method, and we look at the eigenvalues of our projector, not of the eigenvalues of our Hamiltonian. And we look then at upper bounds for the convergence speed. We see that uh, it depends on the angle between starting gas and final solution, which we just ignore. It depends on the spread, which we, well then, yeah, the spread, which we just saw is one minus zero. And it depends on the ratio of the first and the second eigenvalue which is the lowest and second to lowest energy state. And I want to emphasize this is an upper bound. So if you have a low number three, it's still better for your performance, but it's the long-term behavior is dominated by these ratios. And the lambda E's are the eigenvalues of the projector, not the Hamiltonian. So if we now look at a given three state system with a triplet and two singlet states and we're thermomagnetically ordered, then uh, we, the singlets will stay the same regardless of J. And with increasing J, we push up the triplet state. And then we have a first flipping point. And we have a first flipping point. From here on, we will converge to the right solution. And in between the first and the second flipping point, we drastically change the ratio of lambda two to lambda one. So here we will uh, have improved performance. And from here on, the performance will only slightly improve because then we are only affecting the ratios of lambda one to lambda three in the projector. And so that's basically here you would say, now a good a higher J is just better. Of course, that's not true because um, if you go then to very high J, you have to also keep in mind that the highest eigenvalue of H prime will be the one with the lowest spin if you just do the inverse Hofbau principle. And uh, that means for small j, the spread of our H prime will be the same as the spread of our original Hamiltonian. That means that the time step in the deterministic propagation is the same for the unperturbed and the perturbed Hamiltonian or the H prime and the unprimed. And if for very large j, the spread in H prime is just dominated by the um, uh, by the spin by the expectation values of the spin operator, and then your time step starts to follow a one over j dependency, which decreases your time step and is worse for your performance. So there is a tau flipping point, and from that point on, the time step starts to be negatively affected by j, and then your performance decreases. So to summarize, between the first and the second flipping point you get great improvement of convergence with an increasing tau. Then between the second and the tau flipping point, you are at the plateau. You still have slight improvement, but not so much. And then for J larger than the tau flipping point, your convergence deteriorates with the increasing J. And if you have actually do the math and do the, take the derivative after the J, you see it's better to overshoot than to undershoot. So being in that region is less bad than to be in that region. We can have proved that also numerically. Here you have the nine and nine active space and the uh, uh, conversion speed against J. And here we see the first and the second tau flipping point. Uh, sorry, the first and second flipping point and the tau flipping point. Here you again have a deterioration. And here you have a plateau. And between the first and the second flipping point, you have a drastic improvement of conversion speed with increasing J. So now that was all deterministic. In FCQMC, we actually do Monte Carlo, QMMC. So and um, there, there you have different choices for the time step. The conventional choice is first that expression. And you here you can see it depends on the so-called excitation generator in FCQMC. And it might create discontinuous steps where your J kind of starts earlier to, to where your Time step starts to depend earlier on J, sometimes with, discon with um, discontinuous steps or non-smooth steps when you have a different minimum in that expression. 
but um, there also in that case there will be a j large enough where it's then also just dominated smoothly by a j to the power of minus one behavior and that then depends this j's tau flipping point and i also want to mention that so far we only talked about long time limit convergence large j's are also bad for stochastic stability so sometimes you don't want to go to too high j's so now we apply this to a very simple system in a bit larger system you all know the oxygen dimer and there are three low lying states uh, and the ground state is this triplet sigma state so we are in a ferromagnetically ordered system and let's say you want to target the singlet delta um, state then we need for example spin purification or spin eigenfunctions to achieve uh, to to go to that state and we did oxygen in equilibrium, full CI, 16 electrons and 28 orbitals. And uh, we, that perhaps answers your questions. I mean, we usually just do small active space calculations and then go from there to the higher. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Someone else's question. Sorry. And uh, uh, we, we use two bash MC as a reference. And here you can see the single delta and the triple sequence state. And both Google and Slater determinant based calculations converge to the same solution. And the triplet, it's of course much faster because the alpha alpha determinants are already spin eigenfunctions. Here you need a bit more population to do the spin recoupling. And in here you see the convergence with respect to population number. Um, and here the convergence looks bad for the Slater determinant based code and for Google. But on the other hand, the Time for the matrix element calculate evaluation is much faster than slater determinant based code. So for the same quality of calculation, we are as fast as Google, as you can see. And now for this um, manganese cluster that Giovanni already showed us, um, we have three manganese for a plus, which then can be coupled to uh, nine different spin states, and they are non-monotonically ordered, at least. What people found in the experiment, and this sum of three half is the ground state. If you do a minimal class 99, you get a ferromagnetically ordered system with a nine half ground state. And we did this as a first test of the method to just play around with different J values. That's what Giovanni already showed, so I won't go into detail here. But you definitely, you can see with J equal zero, you just converge to the wrong spin state. Um, or not, not the spin state you want if you want to go to the low spin state. And then if you do the large cusp, 55 and 38 orbitals, and uh, I don't read out the orbitals, but if it's interesting for you. So here we concentrated now on the doublet and the quartet spin state. And here that's kind of emphasizing one tricky thing about the method. Because um, if you go from the doublet to the triplet, here it's like being quartet. Uh, sorry, quartet. Yes, uh, it's like being ferromagnetically ordered. While if you then go from the quartet to the higher spin states, then it's like being antiferromagnetically ordered. So from here you don't have the problem of pulling in higher spin states. While here you have the problem that you might um, admix uh, spin states from from here. So um, that shows also in this behavior with regards to the j value where for uh, low j values we get to a lower energy and now you think our ah, variational principle and whatever that the low j values are actually good but they aren't because the orange line here which is the lowest j value doesn't converge to the right spin state we want here and we can monitor this in the spin contamination um, where we didn't even put the j 10 to the power of minus 4 we just put 10 to the power of minus 2 and minus 3 and you see that 10 to the power of minus 3 was basically spot on and that's the green line here which is high in energy and uh, the red one kind of perhaps then will converge to the right spin state if you go into uh, very high populations but you definitely see considerable spin contamination and the 10 to the power of minus 4 if at all it converges to the right solution, I mean we don't want to do that. And in the in the 
uh, ported, uh, we then don't need um, we don't need to force the convergence to the right spin state depending on the J value, although we will still affect performance, of course. So now uh, I can close and want to emphasize that yes, it's a very simple approach, but it's extremely efficient because uh, FTAQMC benefits from sparsity and the spin operator is multi reference but sparse. And uh, we have a very efficient approach for spin purification in FTAQMC. It's depending on system comparable to the Google FTAQMC. We have rich code and theory now already available, and it's implemented in EC and in uh, M7, which is a new C++ code in our group. And I hope that then Stochastic Google does come to the next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are, we are extremely on time, so we have uh, room for a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so, so if you look then at the projected energy, like, I mean, that's what we mean by unstochastic noise. So you, you, you see it, it's not something you okay, have to get, read about. And this will get even larger when I get higher. Yes, I mean, it really depends on the system. If you have a system that is just single reference and always stays single reference, um, and you start, for example, from an Two to two to alpha alpha determinant, then uh, the J doesn't affect the stochastic noise. In your specific question, answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Question. There is a question online. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Oscar. Uh, really nice talk. Um, I, I just wanted a couple of very quick questions. First one, going back to the original premise of your talk, what is the right way to choose J then? Um, I understand theoretically, uh, but is, is the answer actually that you try different values and look at the spin contamination? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, sorry, it's the thing is you don't know a priori that there is such a plateau so i think sure. it's still nice information that over a wide range you're pretty stable with regards to j and yes you you monitor spin contamination and you monitor your um your performance and as you saw later on in the in the manganese calculation we we varied j over orders of magnitude sure and then you will find that yeah, normally three four tests will be sufficient for me but you can also implement what uh, um, ignacio was suggesting you can have a dynamically adapted j on during during the full section c dynamic mm. you can check the spin contamination while you yeah yeah, yeah with that that'd be doing. nice uh, the, the other quick question was um this is all for finding low energy singlet states uh so i mean the question is i guess if you can use this penalty method to target other spin states perhaps by looking at j times s squared minus your target state spin all squared or something like that yeah so there this second order penalty approach is also discussed in the event paper for the um right uh for for davidson ci and the yeah it, it looks conceptually nicer but also already in davidson ci it was just worse in performance um and I mean, it was that talk kind of started really as a side project. We thought one day, I mean, yeah, it's easy to implement. Let's try it. And then it worked really well. Of course, one could then also test perhaps the second order penalty works better in FCAQMC than it did in Davidson. So yeah, could be, yes. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Lam. Okay. So if there are no other questions, let's thank Oscar again.